Earning money from trash? You heard that right. Burnt out laptops, flickering TVs, and old phones you throw away are helping the world pocket more than USD 80 billion every year. Behind those worn out gadgets lies an astonishing recycling chain. Discarded electronics are collected, dismantled, safely treated, then shredded and separated into their purest material forms, brought back to life and reborn as raw resources for thousands of new products. This invisible industry fuels hundreds of modern sectors, from smartphones and electric vehicles to renewable energy and global infrastructure. Today, the Factorin takes you deep inside that process, where every broken circuit board and scorched microchip is transformed into a powerful new resource with enormous value. Electronic waste is now the fastest growing waste stream on the planet. In 2024 alone, humanity generated more than 62 million tons of e-waste, heavier than 4,500 Eiffel Towers combined. What's even more alarming is that only 20% of that amount is properly collected and processed. The rest is burned, dumped, or handled informally, causing tens of billions of dollars in valuable metals to vanish every year. More critically, e-waste isn't just made of recyclable circuit boards and metals. It also carries lead, mercury, cadmium, flame retardants, and other toxic compounds that can leak into soil or spread through the air for decades. That's why recycling e-waste isn't simply about cleaning up trash, it's about preserving resources and protecting ourselves. Only when handled correctly do discarded devices get a second life instead of becoming a burden future generations must pay for. The recycling journey doesn't begin inside a factory. It starts the moment a device is officially retired by its owner. A laptop with dead keys, a dark screen TV, or a smartphone past its prime. E-waste appears everywhere, in homes, offices, schools, enterprise upgrades, and through retailer or manufacturer trade-in and take-back programs. Once collected in sufficient volume, these discarded devices are loaded onto specialized transport trucks and sent directly to recycling facilities. At large-scale plants, capable of processing up to 6 million pounds of e-waste every month, continuous industrial operation becomes possible. Yet most electronic waste is still improperly collected, creating risks of fires, contamination, and environmental damage. To change that, many countries are expanding their collection networks. In Singapore, by mid-2026, all community centers will be equipped with e-waste bins, pushing the total number of collection points beyond 1,000, supported by the Alba Step Up app that helps residents locate the nearest drop-off. Meanwhile, across Europe and North America, municipal drop-off sites, take-back counters at electronics retailers, and scheduled collection drives are becoming the mandatory entry gate before e-waste enters a professional recycling line. After electronic scrap is collected from urban bins, consolidation sites, or recovery centers, specialized trucks transport it continuously to the recycling plant. Through the entrance lies a vast receiving yard, concrete floors, high steel roofing, and long warehouse-style storage racks where old computers, broken TVs, and dead phones are unloaded and stacked into layered piles like mountains of forgotten hardware. At this stage, engineers weigh each pallet, tag it with an identification code, and log its data into the plant system to monitor weight, origin, and collection frequency. This tracking allows operators to plan day by day, even shift by shift, ensuring that shredding capacity and material separation lines remain balanced and fully utilized. Only once records are complete does the e-waste move into the segregation area. Here, workers perform preliminary sorting based on device characteristics. IT and computer equipment, monitors and TVs, large appliances, and refrigeration units. Routing material into the correct stream reduces jamming, stabilizes throughput, and according to data from major recycling facilities, can increase overall efficiency by 20-30%. Before electronic devices enter heavy processing lines, they must pass through a stage where robots still can't replace human hands. Manual dismantling. E-waste is never uniform. Every model has a different component layout. Every generation uses a different screw pattern. 
That variability makes humans the most flexible and precise machine for this job. Here at long dismantling benches, workers equipped with dozens of screwdrivers, pliers, and specialized tools strip devices layer by layer. They remove plastic casings, metal frames, circuit boards, wiring, and bulky parts to reduce each unit into a safer, cleaner form, one that won't break a shredder or choke an industrial conveyor. During dismantling, valuable modules like RAM, motors, hard drives, copper wiring, and intact PCBs are separated for reuse or metal extraction. Not every device is destroyed. Many working parts are cleaned and performance tested, then moved into refurbishment streams. Some ITAD companies in the US and Europe even operate on a revenue share model, meaning the original owner receives a payout when a recovered component is successfully resold, quite literally turning trash into profit. And here is the detail most people don't expect. Recycled copper from e-waste can reach purity of 99.99%, high enough that several manufacturers actually prefer it over mined copper because the quality is identical while cost and emissions drop dramatically. In the end, the precision of this dismantling phase does more than maintain workflow. It determines the economic value of the entire batch. After dismantling, e-waste must be cleared of every component that could explode, ignite, or release toxic chemicals. A single hazardous part left behind is enough to halt the entire system on emergency stop. The most critical example is the lithium-ion battery found in phones and laptops. If one gets trapped in a shredder, it can short-circuit and burst into flame almost instantly. A burning cell can reach temperatures above 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to ignite surrounding plastic and metal and trigger a dangerous chain fire across the line. For this reason, workers remove all batteries by hand, inspect each one individually, and place them into fire-resistant containers to ensure complete isolation before anything reaches the crusher. Refrigerators and air conditioners follow a similar precaution. Technicians must extract all remaining Freon and compressor oil to prevent gas leaks that damage the ozone layer. Using a dedicated recovery unit, they connect to the refrigerant line and pull every trace of gas into a sealed storage cylinder. Only when the system confirms that no coolant remains is the appliance cleared for further teardown. Old CRT televisions and early generation monitors add yet another layer of risk. Their glass contains lead, and the inner coating may carry mercury, so the screens must be disassembled manually, piece by piece, to recover safe material. If a tube breaks inside a shredder, lead dust and mercury vapor can disperse into the air. Dangerous for workers in the environment. To prevent that, technicians open the casing with precision tools, separate the picture tube, and seal the hazardous portion inside an airtight container for controlled processing. When the hazardous components and high-value parts have been removed, the remaining device is reduced to its frame and outer materials. No batteries, no chemicals, no ignition risks. At this point, the scrap is safe enough to enter mechanical processing. The remaining units are placed onto a feed conveyor ready for shredding to reduce size and prepare material for downstream separation. Depending on the system, some facilities compress devices into compact blocks so the shredder runs smoothly, lowering torque load and preventing mechanical jams. In high-throughput lines, the scrap is fed directly into the cutting chamber without pre-compaction, allowing faster hourly processing. Most shredders operate in two stages. The first stage uses counter-rotating knives to shear and break devices into smaller chunks. The second stage is a high-speed grinding chamber where the fragments are crushed and refined to a controlled size before entering the separation line. The entire operation is monitored from a control room through cameras and sensors to maintain safety and stability. At full industrial scale, a shredding system can process 7 to 10 tons of electronic waste per hour. After this step, the material reaches a uniform particle size and is ready for component-based separation. After leaving the shredder, the mixed fragments are carried onto a wide conveyor belt. Here, the plant deploys high-intensity industrial magnets, powerful enough to pull out every piece of iron and steel from the chaotic mix in just a few seconds. Steel shards from TV chassis, computer housings, laptop hinges, and metal skeletons snap upward immediately and fall into a dedicated stream. 
This is the fastest, most visible, and arguably the most crucial separation stage, because steel almost always represents the largest share of the e-waste mass. The remaining materials, including aluminum, copper, plastics, glass, and circuit boards, continue onward to other sorting systems where they will be separated into individual material flows. But in this segment, we follow the path of steel, the most recycled material on Earth and the backbone of countless industries worldwide. Once separated, the steel is compressed into large bales and shipped to specialized steel-making plants. After inspection and quality approval, each bale is fed into an electric arc furnace, the point where its second life truly begins. Inside the sealed furnace, arcs thousands of times more powerful than natural lightning strike into the scrap, raising temperatures to more than 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. In just minutes, the fragments liquefy completely, turning into a glowing pool of molten steel, bright and fluid like boiling magma. As the metal melts, impurities rise to the surface and are skimmed away using dedicated removal tools. This deep, clean stage strips out unwanted elements. Next, engineers fine-tune the composition by adding carbon or alloying elements such as manganese, nickel, or chromium to achieve precise mechanical characteristics for each steel grade. With real-time sensors tracking temperature and chemistry, recycled steel maintains remarkable consistency often more uniform than steel produced directly from mined ore. From the electric arc furnace, molten steel flows into a continuous casting system, passing through water-cooled molds where it forms into glowing billets, square or flat, still red and bright. Once solid enough to withstand mechanical handling, billets stretching many tens of meters are cut into standard lengths and immediately transferred to the hot rolling section while their internal heat remains high reducing the need for reheating energy. Here, the billets are reheated to about 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit to bring the entire cross-section to a uniform temperature. This even heat distribution relieves internal stress, prevents cracking during rolling, and it ensures the steel becomes sufficiently soft to reshape. Infrared thermal sensors along the furnace constantly track temperature variation. Even a deviation of only several dozen degrees can affect flatness and mechanical strength in the final product. Once the billet reaches its ideal plasticity, it enters the massive rolling stands. Each pair of rollers reduces thickness and increases length according to a predetermined ratio. From several initial inches, the material is gradually elongated and widened through multiple rolling passes until it reaches precise industrial dimensions. This entire transformation happens within seconds, while high-pressure water jets remove oxide scale from the surface and keep temperature from exceeding safe limits. Depending on application, hot rolled steel can be shaped into plate for factory structures and mechanical parts, coil for stamping and precision cutting, or rebar for bridges, buildings, and reinforced concrete infrastructure. These are foundational materials for nearly every modern manufacturing sector. As it exits the final stand, the steel is cooled in a controlled manner to stabilize its crystal structure, then cut to specified lengths and bundled into large stacks. From there, it travels to downstream fabrication plants, where it evolves again into components, structures, and finished products ready for the world. Before a batch can leave the mill, it must undergo mechanical and chemical verification, tensile and bend tests, ultrasonic crack detection, and full composition analysis to ensure compliance with industry specifications. Only after meeting every requirement is the steel bundled, labeled, and released from the plant. From these billets, fabrication plants will transform the metal into bridge girders, skyscraper frames, elevator shells, and even next-generation electric vehicles. Few people realize that nearly 40% of the world's steel supply comes from recycled material, meaning the bridge you cross each morning or the car passing you on the highway may contain metal that once lived inside an old television in your living room a decade ago. This regeneration of steel saves up to 75% of the energy compared to producing virgin steel while cutting millions of tons of carbon dioxide emissions every year closing the loop and building a sustainable material cycle for global industry.
From e-waste, steel begins a new life and continues shaping the world we live in. In a world where technology accelerates day by day, the lifespan of electronic devices has never been shorter. Yet e-waste is not the end. It is the beginning of a new cycle, where resources are recovered, reborn, and returned to industry and form stronger than before. Those discarded devices are now quietly becoming the steel that builds bridges, the components that drive electric cars, the beams of new skyscrapers, and the backbone of modern infrastructure. They are no longer waste. They are raw potential, waiting to be reshaped into progress. Inside refineries and rolling mills, inside foundries and fabrication plants, yesterday's broken gadgets are forging tomorrow's world. If you want to keep exploring the hidden technologies behind the doors of factories across the planet, how they melt, mold, and reinvent the building blocks of civilization, stay with the Factorin in the videos ahead. A new journey begins every time something old is thrown away.